Australian Veteran News viewers, thanks uh, Jackie Lambie for joining us once again um, to give us an update on, on uh, what's happening. Um, particularly, we're going to focus a little bit on, on your current um, tour at Townsville, um, but also to seek an update on um, the issues surrounding, surrounding the legislation, legislation of the National Commissioner for Defence and Veteran Suicide Prevention. Now, the last time we spoke about this, Jackie, last year, um, you asked for us to all would get off the defence on the off the, the fence on this issue, um, and I know a petition went around, and there's been a lot of work in between in between uh, then and now. So I was hoping you might give us an update on on what's happening with that uh, with that proposed legislation and the and I guess the fight against um, uh, allowing that to go into, into place. Yeah. So that proposed legislation, I do not have the numbers at this point in time. So as long as Labor, the Greens. Um, and Central Alliance hold their positions. Um, means they don't they don't have the numbers to actually get the legislation through uh, for the National Commissioner. The National Commissioner, if you go to her website, you can. She's been putting up who she's seen. You'll see that um, she's seen a lot of the uh, service organisations that nod their heads, and you know the ones that apparently represent us but don't. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's where they've started off. Um, uh, apparently, she's been. They've been done a trip up here, um, and only certain certain people were invited. Certain people weren't. Um, so, I'm not exactly what sort of game she's playing at here, uh, which is quite disappointing. And in the meantime, you've either got the defence minister, what I'm hearing, the defence minister, or the secretary following around her, following mm. around behind her tail. Um, or on her tail, um, which I, I really want to thank them for the complete independence they're so far giving us, which is bullshit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's really, it's not starting off well. Um, I wouldn't well, say the things that, proposed commissioner. These are the things that I think you, you were quite fearful of and I think many of the, in our, excuse me, our community quite quite concerned about the possibility that, excuse me, we won't have this sort of uh, independence that we're looking for. And that, um, you know, the, the whole idea of the commissioner engaging with the community at the moment, it looks like... Um, a bit of an exercise in uh, trying to, to gain some support um, rather than really getting information and being selective about who they're speaking to. Yeah, I would, uh, look, I, um, it is it is concerning, but what's even more concerning is that it's not just those <laughs> under Veterans Affairs, it's those that are in defence. We know that there's lives going, being lost on base. Um, do you honestly believe that their mates, as much as they want to come forward, are going to trust to come forward to a former brigadier. So you've, you've already shut it. It's already it's already shut down. There's no trust. They wonder, you know, this is never going to work because there's no trust. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's not independent and there's no trust, and that's the truth of it. It's just going to be a fail, failed exercise. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's, pro it's proving itself that way as well. And, I, and I've heard uh, independently from others that, um, you know, and I'm talking about families myself um, who've been in touch with Australian Veteran News about their experience and anguish about not being invited to round tables. And it seems rather selective. And it's all about sort of trying to build a bit of a base of support for the commissioner. Um, and it, it sort of certainly looks that way. Now, that may not be true, but there's been very little transparency in about what these... Um, and what this sort of roadshow uh, that she's been on is all about, and um, I think it's a it's, it is reasonable cause for concern. And, I, and it's interesting that, um, that you know, yourself, with Bob Catter and others, have decided to go out to the community um, and engage with the veteran community directly. And I'm interested to hear about how that's been going and what you've um, what you've learned from that process. Yeah, so I, I was doing that anyway right from the beginning, but then obviously I had two years on the sidelines because of my dual citizenship. And then last year was COVID, so I need to get back out there. It's actually, um, it's very um, surprising out there that, you know, it's now, I've, when did I get in? Uh, in 2013, so we're now on my eighth year, minus mm. the three years. So that's put, that's, I believe that's put us behind. I do apologise for that. Um, but I can tell you that momentum for Royal Commission, I've never seen, I've never seen momentum. This is the most I've seen it. Um, you know, I was in the RSL, we had quite a mixture of service organisations in there. Um, what day is it today? Tuesday. So that was yesterday. Yes. Uh, yes, yesterday. And then we had another group from six to eight, just anyone that wanted to come in individually. Um, and I can tell you now, out of those people that were in that room, those service organisations, when they stood up, um, you know, I've had um, Heston Russell um, tagging alongside me and he got up and said, right, how many in this room actually want a Royal Commission? There was about 80%. 
Now, eight years ago when I called for this, there was not much going on. There was not much show of hands. So mm. you can see the momentum's really starting um, to yeah. gather out there, which is a good thing. Yeah. And I think one of the things is, is it's been difficult because the community, I think, generally, I mean, in the outside of the veteran community, don't really understand it. And I think even inside our community, um, people I've spoken to, when we discuss it, they've said, oh, but we've got in a Royal Commission and they don't understand the difference between a commissioner and a Royal Commission and, and, and what it means. And I think it's been, it's the way it's been sold and packaged up um, as a solution. And it is, as, as you look into it, you realise how inadequate it truly is, and I think that's that's the cause of concern. Um, one of the things you mentioned, Jackie, was about the um, the ex service organisations, and there's a lot of engagement with by politicians with ex service organisations. I think you know, in, in in I think in good faith and the belief that they are speaking for the veteran community, um, but I think there's a fair bit of research out there um, that shows that. There's a lot of veterans who, much greater number of veterans who won't join an ex-service organisation and actually prefer to stay away from them than actually will work in with an ex-service organisation. And the other question is about, does, do the ex-service organisations actually have the ability to adequately engage with their constituents anyway? I mean, they're often volunteers and they probably do their best, but are they adequately resourced and are they the right people to do that work? No, they're extremely divided out there, mate. That's a really unfortunate thing. That's where we are at and we're all fighting over chicken feed and, you know, you have to ask. I mean, you, let's use the Defence Force Welfare Association as an example here that have been apparently up there building it out there for us for years and we've lost more and more. Mm. So they're not getting the job done. Uh, they're certainly not getting the job done. They've failed to get the job done for us and uh, 20 years later and we're in the worst situation than what we've probably ever been in. So that's really... Uh, sort of discouraging out there. Look, there's some great groups. Look, you've got to look at, you know, where's these hubs? We were promised these hubs uh, yeah. in the last election, still waiting for them. We know that Mates for Mates has done a great job of building a great model in Brisbane. Your model's done, and here we are doing a bloody 200, I think it's 200,000 bucks a University of Tasmania, doing a model for Tasmania down there. Now, if your model's done, it's working, and it's a one-stop shop, and they've pretty much got it tickety-boo, wouldn't you just take it off that, mate? Wouldn't you just take it off that? Just use the cookie cutter and repeat it. But I guess oh, one of the right. things is that this the idea of the hubs is is, is very it seems on, on on the face value very compelling. But um, one of the things we also know is that veterans um, often don't want to um, go to a physical location. They're actually relying on uh, social media and other informal networks to try and get information and work out what to do, or they just don't engage at all. So the, in many ways, the hub is not necessarily a full solution either. Um, and it's community work that I think needs to happen to really, to, to really, um, you know, get the message out there rather than sort of centralised type of, you know, affairs. So have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, we're really down advocates out there. Uh, that's that's a real problem. So that, that you know, that's one of your first problems getting these um, claims done. Uh, I think I think the one stop shops are certainly the best option I've seen in the whole time I've been here. When you know mm -hmm. that you can go in there and you see your psychologist, psychiatrist, you can get your claims done. Uh, they're now spreading out to make sure they're getting activity and family activities done weekends. And they're getting the community, bringing them in to run the activities and giving them a lot more choice. You can see it actually working in Brisbane from, you know, I've watched this, the, yeah. you know, they started about eight years when I come in and they're just getting bigger and better at it. They're now going out on the bases. Uh, you know, I, I am hearing that they, they can't, they don't have enough people to put out in those bases. Yeah. So, you know, you can start to see them stretching out and that they, I think they're doing, with the resistance that they've had against them all the way to be able to stay that resilient and keep pushing on and get as far as what they have. They've done a great job and I think there's no breaker. I think you'll find they're breaking through, mate. I just yeah. need one. I need them spread around Australia and I need them in every state. Hmm. But, I think you know, um, Western Australia making some progress in this area. I spoke to the CEO of the RSL there and they've got a lot of government support and, and a good collaboration between some of the other ex-service organisations in the development of a hub concept. And I think Victoria's, you know, you know on the, hot on their heels trying to uh, replicate some of that as well. But, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's all in the execution. Like, you know, they've got to have the yeah, capability yeah. and the ability to implement it. And sometimes um, my fear is that some... You know, the people are all uh, good intention, but they, they need a lot more support to get these things done. And, um, you know, that, that requires money and, and um, you know, I guess really good oversight and governance of how these things are implemented as well, because you can end up have the same situation as you have with current ESOs where self-interest and fiefdom sort of, um, you know, evolve yet again. 
Yeah, what I'm starting to see is the breakup of, you know, uh, these people retiring, um, you know, uh, the officers, the high-ranking officers start retiring out of the um, military and, and we're going, actually, we don't want you in our organisations. Uh, you know, I can see the diggers. The diggers are much better educated probably than what you and I were, mate. We're a little bit older. We could leave you in year 10. Uh, you know, they're coming into the army. They're a lot more um, equipped mm. with the education thing and they're now starting to fight back. Yeah. So they bloody should. You know, they're yeah. starting to use that education say, no, no, that's bullshit. And they're starting to question. Uh, and and they're finding different ways to do things out. too, which is, which, is, which is encouraging too because you need a lot more innovation in this area. Um, a lot more than just copying, you know, some some basic, simple formulas. I really think we need to understand uh, a lot more about what people are really wanting to do and, and, and what they want to get out of the services that they're seeking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, we're still coming back to the basics. We're still not doing the transition very good. You know, I've been mm. all talking about this for 30 years. Diggers still not walking out, walking out, walking out with qualifications to the civilian, you know, equivalent to civilian. I am hearing in some parts it's hit and miss, that all this belting I've been saying, you do not release them from defence until they've got their claims done. There is some starting to do that. Mm. But like I said, it's hit and miss, so I'm hoping that that um, that continues. Uh, and that means if they're not well enough, they don't check in and say, hey, good morning, salute you and walk out. I don't understand, mate, if they're not in that condition, why well, they're just not doing, making a phone call or popping one of their mates around to make sure they're okay each day. What about, you know, if I'm still having that problem is I just don't want to go on the base or shake when I get there. What do I need to report every morning when I'm supposed to be at sick? I don't understand. You know, this is not a good system. Mm. This is not mm. a good system. Yeah. You can't tell me that one of us can't check on them. You know, you have ops corporals in your unit. When the reason most of those ops corporals are there usually is because people respect them. So why can't they ring up and say, hey, mate, you're all right? Listen, why can't I have a coffee with you? Whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, there needs to be a lot more of that going on. So I'm hoping that that does. I did ask the military and put it on them that why COVID was going on, if they, unless they didn't, if they didn't have to medically discharge them or discharge them. If they wanted to hold off, could they hold off? Because they're going to walk out. There was no jobs. There was no options. Mm. Could they hold them back? So... Once again, hit and miss. Some commanders have actually done that. Some haven't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I guess one of the things, that it's the social support is really important both in and out. And, and you look at some of the more successful um, RSL sub-branches such as Hawthorne, which is it's always worth uh, worthy giving them a plug because they do such a great job. But they're, it's, it's they're a very unique situation. They, they, they only have service members pretty much. Um, you know, they've got a, a good following, um, you know, and, and a good strong social network, but it relies on, on key people to keep it going. And it's not something that's easy to replicate um, at other RSLs either. It hasn't been successfully copied in many places. And so, you know... No, they're, 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 they're successful, mate. They can hardly get any money out of the government to get going. How about that? Geez, you wouldn't want to be successful. You'd think yeah. you'd be saying, gee, you guys are doing a great job. Here's money for your building. Go for it. Get out yeah. there and get those young vets in. Hmm. Common sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I, I guess what I'm talking about, Jack, is how do you how do you how do you get the uh, how do you copy that? Um, because I know from uh, from all accounts from people I've spoken to who are involved in that RSL that they get great social support. Um, there's there's jobs, there's all sorts of things that um, that they get out of it. And um, again, it's not for everybody either. Though not everybody wants to join an RSL and be into that kind of you know that kind of group either. So you know that you can't have other people slipping through the cracks because they're not uh, they're not socially inclined in that way as well. So there's a you know, there's some twos and fro's with this in terms of how to how to set this up properly, and um, obviously need a, a multi no. uh, approach to it. Yeah, no, that that's correct. And, and you know what, we we can't we can't say we're we're never going to stop. We can't save everybody, but what we can do is bloody we'll give them give them half a chance, and that comes down to that transition. Yeah. And then you know, if if they're thinking in a better mind, then they they're more than likely to go into those clubs. Uh, by the way, uh, right now everybody's talking about the Hawthorne RSL and what, what a job it's doing. That's going on all around Australia, I can tell you now. So word is spreading. Yeah. Word is spreading. Um, you know, so it's word of mouth and it is spreading. So that's how it works. But, you know, some people, when they when they hit it, as you would know, when you hit rock bottom, you shut yourself off, you shut your family off, you shut your front door, that's it. So if I can alleviate most of them getting to that point, uh, but that will come down to the transition, make sure they haven't got those financial burdens all over mm. waiting for claims to go through, that sort of thing. Got to fix that first. 
Yeah, and I, I guess one of the other things is a lot of deep, deeply personal things, apart from the administration itself, you know, the issues of um, identity and where you fit in the community and those sorts of things. And that's and that's where I think the broader community support is required and recognition um, that uh, the veteran community has a lot to offer, uh, particularly around the, in the area, a key area of employment and those sorts of things. So, you know, there, there are things that I think we, we, we need to sort of get some messaging around on that as well. So, um, Jackie, can we talk a little bit about what you've been doing in Townsville, where you've, where you've been, who you've spoken to, that sort of thing? Um, yeah, so uh, what have we done here? It's been a, been a pretty pretty wild ride. So we've seen the uh, Motorcycle Club, obviously, we've held two meetings at the RSL. Uh, we've been out to um, Toombies. That's where they do the horse whispering stuff. And oh, yes, also, yeah. Yeah, using the, it's, it's wonderful. And some of these, set, we've seen the hard jacket boot camp. Uh, there's one on the Gold Coast, apparently the boys, I think they're RAS or, or commandos, set up this. They're going great guns with these young young um, kids that are most at risk at 12 yeah. or 13. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's giving everyone a hope. So we went to a place like that. Um, we have been out to see the Vietnam veterans, um, Obviously, so that was Zach's. Uh, where else have we been? Um, it's been pretty chockers, mate. I went to the coffee shop, went to the guys who are doing a coffee shop and they're making equipment out there. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, just got a list here. Um, so so, so that, what sort of response doing... have you been getting? You've been getting a lot of people coming to speak to you or is it, are people a little bit suspicious of what you're doing there or no, how, how are you so. finding the reception for you? No, I can tell you now from when I started eight years ago, <laughs> And because I was chaotic as well, that didn't help. Mm. Um, uh, very different change now. I think whether or not I was, I couldn't speak for them over that couple of years because I was out on the sidelines and I had to invest everything I possibly could just to get my seat back to get back up and fight for them. Whether that's mm. made the heart grow a bit fonder, and then I've come back in and continued that fight, whether it's a trust thing or whatever. But they're coming forward now, mate. They're yeah. starting to stand up and they're starting to get really pissed. Yeah. So, so what sort of numbers are you talking about? How many people do you think you may have seen? Oh, look, I was last... pretty lucky if I could get half a dozen to a meeting. You're mm. looking at four, four rooms in RSLs now. You're looking at, um, you know, the, the motorcycle group the other day, that was 150. Um, you know, they're starting to stack in. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's that's a good thing. And it's, it's taken a while to chew, chew to that and get to that. I think it's so bizarre, um, I, you know, the, Why them are they coming turning... out. Sorry, why, why are they turning Sorry. up? Because they've they had want? enough. They can, they're yeah. finally waking up to what's going on. They're seeing their mates. You know, you're now having that, that Middle Eastern group is really feeling the effects mm -hmm. over the last few years. People are starting to see more of that on how these guys have been affected. I think whether or not, um, you know, there's more people saying we do need a Royal Commission. People, we've got a lot more going out in the papers. We're getting people to stand up to all these stories. Uh, so we're getting the public interest out there. Uh, making sure there's um, public understand what's going on that's helped a lot. You know, people that join that jump in. You've got Julianne Finney being one waving the flag, and those other mothers out there for God knows how yeah. long. Mm. You've got Heston Russell's just jumped on, so you've got quite a few of us now starting to come into into the circle. Um, so if I can't get through to one of them, some one hopefully one of the others can. You know, yeah. so the bigger that bunching, the more we get through that, uh, the better. It'd be nice to have some. Um, some former top dogs out of the military. They've got some courage for once to come out and say enough's enough uh, and call it as well. I think that would build more trust and we'd, we'd even have a bigger stance out there. I've just got to keep chipping away, mate. I think the only way that we're going to actually end up getting this, though, is actually taking to the streets. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to have to follow the unions in this. Uh, I don't think that we're running out of choices here. And if we don't start to do something a little bit more evasive, we're just, you know... One, one of the, one I'm of the... losing time, mate, and I haven't got yeah. any more time left. Yeah, and one one of the now I'm losing them. yeah one one of the problems though I think you've, or the challenges you face with with trying to rally that 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 support is that the veteran community is so fragmented yeah. itself yeah. Um, it's not it's not as so co socially cohesive as people might think it is it's actually quite fragmented um, and we're located everywhere <laughs> um, veterans are all over the place and sort of to get a constant a sufficient concentration. 
to to make an impact. Um, you know, you don't want to have a fizzer of an event if you're going to be putting no, something like right. that on, and then you'll end up with you know, it looks like that there's you know, not, as I wrote about it, uh, you know, uh, late last year, it seems like the way vet, the veteran community is being treated is that you know, it's because there's no votes in supporting veterans and their families. And no, it was a bit of a it was a bit of a harsh dig, but you know, it, it is a little bit like that. And I think we need to sort of say, look, there are votes in supporting us, but the problem is, I think they know that we're all over the place and we're not cohesive, and um, that's that's difficult. But this this one issue, sadly, is the issue that actually is bringing us uh, bringing the veteran community together um so what yeah i think i think in a way it is you know and you get those marches in there you know i know who i'll have i'll have my mum there i'll have my dad there and i'll have my mates there they might have served but yeah. that's how we're going to have to do it i'm going to say hey i need you guys to help me out for today i need to come march down the street with me because yeah. we need a big cohort and we need to show the prime minister not putting up this crap anymore and we need a royal commission hmm. and uh unless somebody else can come in i keep saying this if someone's got a better option out there they've got a better way forward um, then please let let me know. Um, the only other way I can do this is if I win that balance of power, which means I need about four or five members in that Senate. Yeah. And right now, um, because I don't take those political donations, that's that's going to be difficult. I'm just not sure, you know. But if yeah. anyone's got any great ideas how we can bring this on, but, you know, uh, time is at the essence right now and we yeah, need to do something. Definitely. Um, what are some of the things that people, so you've had these, these significant, I guess they're crowds of people coming to see you and wanting to talk to you. What, what are the sorts of things that they're telling you? What, what are they saying to you, Jackie? Yeah, so it's the same, it's the times, times on the claims, they've gone out further. It's, uh, the, it's even worse with um, seeing psychologists and psychiatrists and waiting, hmm. um, you know, especially since, since COVID. Um, so that's really, really hurt. It's probably the worst it's ever been. It's the, the places like the Jamie Larkin Centre, the Ward 17s, et cetera, et cetera, not having enough beds. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a shocker. I've been dealing with that the last three or four months. Absolute yeah. shocker. Having to threaten to bring the TV stations down to Ward 17 twice in two months if they don't put my Tasmania veterans in there um, and putting butchies up worse. That's what I mean. So uh, making, you know, not being still doctors stopping, specialists won't see them because DBA's not paying the money that, you know, the public system and the normal people pay. Mm -hmm. I've now got people having to use the NDIS because they can't get what they need out of DBA. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's a new big one. So here comes the NDIS. That's yeah. that's a bit of a shocking one. That one. Um, yeah. And, and obviously the, uh, the the payment cards and all those sorts of things. Have have the families said any any? I mean, that's all. If a lot of those things you covered off just then are about the veterans themselves and seeking their compensation payments and just basic support, I guess, um, and and getting the help in transition. Um, but what have the families have been? What have the families been saying? Yeah, you'll get um, more so the wives, the partners of them. Uh, yeah. They'll come forward. They'll tell you they're saying the same things. So mm. they're saying the same things, and then the effect it's having on their kids as well. Um, you know, which I'm, I'm very aware of. But having that effect, and, and you know, it's no different to me or my girlfriends that served. That we see the effect on our kids. Nothing's changed. The effects having the same effect on their kids. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just because of what they're going it, through. It's unbelievable. And, and my dad not being able to get help, watching, yeah. watching more so, more so the men because there's obviously a much bigger cohort out there. Mm. Um, you know, watching their dad be the soldier he used to be, being being reduced to nothing. Um, yeah. You know, and when you've got the mother, especially if they've got, they you don't usually see this, but sometimes they do have their their children with them because it's, you know they don't have a babysitter or whatever, and you can see the looks in the kids' face especially if they're standing around that table listening. Um, mm. it's, it's, um, it's quite heartbreaking, to be honest. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's difficult to sort of, I mean, as we talk about the fragmentation, some people have great careers and they transition well and they have uh, they go into good jobs afterwards and it is, a you know, as has been pointed out by Darren Chester, a very positive experience for a lot of people. But, they, but it's still, un, you know, disproportionately a very difficult experience um, for many and sometimes it doesn't kind of happen you know, what we found out through some of the research that we conducted um, as part of a shout out program with Melbourne Legacy a few years ago is that there's often a quite a, a delayed um, response to things and people actually have the most serious difficulties one or two or three, three years later. Um, and then they realise they can connect it all back to, to their experiences and, um, you know, uh, a lot of it's a, a crisis of identity and belonging and all, all sorts of things like that and, and missing you know, key aspects of their military lives. So it's it's not a it's not a simple linear thing where if we get this part right, the next part will follow. There's a there's a lot of parts to this. No, but the sad thing is we watched our own uncles, our own fathers or whatever be Vietnam veterans 
go through the same thing that these guys are now going through. Nothing has changed. They've yeah. learned nothing, nothing from what the Vietnam veterans went mm. through and they mm. still have not fixed it. Mm. To me, that's just devastating. Yeah. You know, I, I don't understand that. And, and I guess um, the veteran community is such a small part of Australian society, but it's an important part of it. Um, but there's quite a lot of people in the general public that actually don't know anybody who's served in the military, unlike maybe, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, everybody had a relative or somebody who, who, who had served at some point. Oh, yeah, but, mate, that sentiment, that's not being lost. So yes. this is where the Prime Minister and the Chief of um, Defence has got this completely wrong. That sentiment, mm. just because we don't go out there and we don't get saluted at airports and whatever else, most families have either had a former serving member, they know of a family that's had a serving member or they've known a serving member. Whether it's from World War II, Vietnam, uh, you know, the peacekeeping and the peacemaking, uh, the Gulf War, whatever, usually they've known someone and they've heard, they've heard parts of their story or whatever the sentiment is there. We just don't go and ask them, we don't go and ask the public to, to do that. But trust me, you can see this from when those war crimes come out for Christmas time. Public's going, why are they doing this? We don't want to know about it. Let them get on with their lives, mm. right? Let them get on with their lives. Yeah. So they're not, what they're not doing is when you've got a Prime Minister and a Chief of Defence, what they're not doing is they are completely disconnected to how the public is thinking about people who have served, whether you've served in war or whether you've just served your country. And they are very proud of those people who have worn that uniform. It's just that we don't go and ask for acknowledgement. We're too proud to do that. We just accept that we've, we've been very grateful to have that opportunity and we move and then we mm. move away, you know, so that's yeah. what we do. So they're reading it really wrong. There is great mm. support out there. So, Jackie, there's a challenging pathway ahead, and I think, think just to close out, what just let us know what what are you focusing on next? What what are your what are your key priorities at the moment? Um, well, we just keep well, mate. I don't, you know, we keep keep trying to bring out these stories, making sure they run, making sure the public understands them. Um, you know, see, I'm hearing there might be a bit of movement on the Mefflin stuff, um, which would be good. There's a uh, Hugh Pope's book coming out about the command, all that. So that's what I mean. People are getting braver to stand up talk about what's going on the more more the more material that's out there especially for the public to understand more about uh, those who have served uh, the better off we're going to be mate I just I just have to keep tapping away I go into estimates I keep asking those hard questions mm. we keep pulling you know keep showing them up for what we, they are yeah and I think that local stuff that you're doing at the moment in Townsville, it seems like a great initiative. Will you be doing more of that? I understand it must be very time-consuming and exhausting. Um, is that the sort of thing that you might like to do or do you think you're going to try and um, sort of ramp it up in another way? No, so I'm heading down to South Australia tomorrow, mate. Obviously, I've got guys to see down there and then I'm going into Parliament on Monday. So I'll go and see them and then from there, late Friday night, I'll go there, I'll do some work over the weekend, get ready for Parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll keep moving around now because I don't know if COVID's going to hit or not. So I've got that opportunity. Um, I'll just keep, I'll keep it moving now. I'll get, that's what I used to do. So I'll get back out there to do it. But I've just got to make sure I'll, I've got enough time to still do Tasmania, get out there and make sure I'm listening to them as well. They've been very kind to me and very tolerant. And no one says anything about what I do for the veterans. And I'm always very grateful for Tasmanians uh, for allowing me to do that. And no mm. one ever says a bad word. So... Mm. Um, you know, so I've just got to make sure that, you know, that's the reason I'm there because they vote me in. I've got still got a job to do for them, but why there's no COVID restrictions, just in case it comes back down to move around as quickly as possible over the next three months and get around. Uh, we'll probably be talking to those service organisations that are talking to the commission, been talking to the commissioner. I'll spend a couple of days on the phone saying, uh, how'd you go? What did you tell her? Mm -hmm. uh, and knowing, uh, you know, I've already heard from them. And I said, when I was at the RSL, I said, what you're telling me when you stood in front of the commissioner? Did you tell them the same thing? Yep. So they're telling them exactly what I'm telling you now, mate. Yep. So, you know, it'd be very interesting to see what she takes home with her. Um, but uh, I'll be I'm on her tail. So mm -hmm. I'll be making those calls and that. See well, which service organisations are actually just nodding and which ones are actually saying, no, this is enough. Yep. Well, Jackie Lambie, um, I know that there are many people in the veteran community who admire your advocacy and the energy you're putting into this and, and appreciate it very much. And uh, I think Tasmanians should be quite quite pleased that we're, we're you know, generally appreciative as well. 
Um, and as you know, Australian Veteran News is really behind this issue. We think it's a very important thing and uh, we're trying to be sort of impartial on most matters, but this one we're 100% we're, we're behind. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I've had, I know you've had a busy day, a busy couple of days, and uh, you've had a lot of other demands on your time as well, and I'm glad you uh, chose to uh, spend a few moments with us. No, you're very welcome, mate. I'll keep you updated. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jackie. Good on you. Thank Bye. you so much.